Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, it's wonderful to see so many of you already in the room for this webinar on the future of OPMs and the changing partnership market. Um, please, as you come in, do settle in, say hello. We've got the chat window open and questions, so you are very welcome to come and um, say where you are, where you're joining us from, have a look around, see who else is here. Um, we will be doing a number of polls during the session um, to get a sense for um, what you're feeling in the room, and we're looking forward to hearing what you're thinking about OPMs and the partnership market and, and all that that entails. Um, and I know we have some um, some newcomers, some people who may not have um, attended one of these webinars before. So we're really looking forward to, to seeing some new points of view and some new takes on things. Um, for those of you who haven't joined one of these before, it will be recorded. Um, so don't worry about taking your detailed notes. You can go back um, and listen back whenever you like. Um, and I think that's it for housekeeping. One tip for you, if you haven't been in here before and you haven't used Livestorm before, in the chat window, you'll see a little bell. Um, if you don't want to get a little um, audio ping every time somebody says something in the chat, then you can just click that off um, and you'll see it's got a little mute on it. OK, so today um, Patrick's joining us, the co-CEO of Holland IQ. He's going to be taking us through the bulk of what we're sharing about OPMs and boot camps. Um, and I will be um, on the fringes helping out as well. Um, again, because I know there's quite a few of you who may not have joined one of these before. Um, if you don't know Holland IQ, um, we are an impact intelligence platform and we're working across three major impact ver verticals of education, health and climate. Um, we have a beautiful, truly global team um, based out of three main hubs in New York, in London and in Sydney. Um, and our customers are equally global. Um, there's just a very small selection of them there, but you can see we're working with universities, we're working with um, government, with academia, with finance, with um, some of the major tech companies. Um, it's a really, really diverse bunch and it really helps us as much as I think it helps the people that we're working with as well to work with such a diverse group. So situating where we are in this current series, it's a five part series and we're right in the middle. Um, we're on webinar three on OPMs and we started with digital transformation, looking at where we are now in higher education. Last week we had our guest speaker, Rajika Bandari, and we went deep into international education and looking at the size and shape of that. Um, and then coming up before the end of March, we will have taken a trip, a virtual trip to Latin America to have a look at digital transformation there. And then we're finishing up with new credentials um, and where to next, which is always a massive, massive topic. So the agenda for today, um, warning, there's a lot to get through um, as always, um, but we're gonna take you through starting with the higher education digital capability framework and where OPMs fit in to that framework. Um, and then I'll hand over to Patrick. He's going to take you through some of the macro and digital context that underpins OPMs, some of the big numbers on OPMs. And then it's, it's hard to talk about OPMs without starting to talk about boot camps as well. So there'll be a little dip into what's been happening with boot camps and how that side of things may or may not be shifting. And then looking ahead to some OPM scenarios, looking ahead as, as, as far as we can out to 2030 and what may or may not be happening. So just, um, we often start these conversations by reviewing the higher education digital capability framework. Um, so for those of you who haven't come across this before, this has been our focal point really when we've been looking at digital transformation in higher education and a way to bring together, you know, if you're in a university environment, to bring together all of the many functions that have to take responsibility and share responsibility for digital capability, but also looking deep into what are the digital capabilities that underpin um, what's happening in higher education. So um, following a learner life cycle lens from left to right, you've got demand and discovery, which includes things like marketing processes, student recruitment, enrollment, through into learning design, where you're into the curriculum design side of things, digital content, subject matter expertise, teaching strategies, through into the learner experience. Um, so that encompasses all kinds of things from academic administration to the learning itself and what digital capabilities underpin and help and enhance that. Student life, which is an equally important part of being in higher education and assessment and verification. 
and then work in lifelong learning, which concludes and also restarts the learner life cycle. Um, so you see themes in there like work integrated learning, career planning and placement, industry and business engagement, and then alumni and continuing education. What's also fun to do is when we have a theme like OPMs or international education is to look into this framework and, and try to color in the boxes that are most applicable. Now, I invariably get an email from at least one person, if not more, after each of these webinars saying you colored in the wrong boxes or you've left out this. And I absolutely agree. There is no single view on how the framework applies. And, and OPMs in particular come in so many different shapes and sizes now that it's very hard to make blanket statements. But thinking about where OPMs have been and are sitting now even, um, if you look in demand and discovery, for example, they've been very deep in the product strategy space and, and things like, you know, have some have made their name in making enrollment management a much smoother process, for example, and, and filling in capabilities that an organization may not have for themselves. Learning design has been a massive, massive focus um, in the last few years, and we're seeing really deep capabilities um, in OPMs and in the partnerships that they're creating with institutions that, that look at capabilities around curriculum design and teaching strategies. And um, there's some really interesting two-way capability exchanges that I think we're, we're seeing build up as some of these partnerships really bed in. Um, learner experience, of course, there's no point bringing students in if they're then not having a good, smooth, um, helpful, fruitful experience in getting the outcomes that they want. So of course, OPMs play in this space as well. Um, and then in work and lifelong learning, that connection, that really strong connection back into industry, and that's why that third vertical of industry and business engagement is kind of coloured all the way down. Um, there's real strengths um, in what OPMs can and do offer in connecting into industry and making sure that um, higher education and industry are, are working smoothly, talking to each other, and that things are relevant there. So that's a very quick overview of how you can look place that OPM lens on the higher education digital capability framework. And I hope you are listening because already it's your turn. Um, we're going to send a poll live in a moment. And if you haven't been in the platform before, you can find the polls bottom right. It's labeled polls. It's got a little pie chart. And in a minute, that'll have a little red dot next to it. Um, and it'll ask you to choose an answer um, to the question, which digital capabilities of an OPM are the most critical for supporting their university partners? Do you think it's demand and discovery? Do you think it's learning design? Do you think it's learner experience? Or do you think it's work and lifelong learning? They usually, the percentages change around a bit before they settle, so I'm just gonna give it another minute or so. Definitely changed, super. Yeah. Yeah. That keep changing. <laughs> yep. Okay, so as it slows down, we're looking at that's interesting. I don't think we've seen learner experience up so high before when we've been talking with people about OPM. So learner experience and demand and discovery um, are both sitting up at kind of um, 34, 35%, and then learning design. 18 and then work and lifelong learning 14 percent and and i wonder if that's a bit of a reflection on the journey of the last two years and that increasing focus on learner experience and making sure that you know yes the academics are taken care of and the academic experience but also how are students being supported through what has been and what will continue to be probably a fairly disrupted unusual time so um that's certainly reflecting the, some of the conversations that um i've had with people um, Patrick, I might pass over to you at this point. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Lucy. Hello, everybody. There's nearly 600 of us from all around the world. It is unbelievable to see how many corners of the globe we are catching right now. Um, there's a few folks in Europe who are up very late. Um, our friends across the Americas, Latin America, huge contingent as well. Um, I can see um, a few people from Ukraine. Our thoughts and prayers are with you as well in these um, these times. Let me move on. This is going to be a fast and furious presentation as usual for those who, who usually join us way too much, way too quickly. That's why we send a recording straight after, um, as Lucy mentioned. So let's dive straight in. Um, there are a ton of customers actually on the call as well. 
Um, you will find that information and for those who aren't familiar, if you go into markets and either select higher education or into clusters and select OPMs um, and for example, click on our developments, filter by partnerships, you'll come, you'll see all the recent partnerships that have been announced in the last few days um, and weeks and dive into each one of those, as you know, to capture key details relating to each of those developments in this case, kind of partnerships as we deep dive into OPMs. Um, I thought it was important to start with a really big picture. I think it's easy in a conversation like OPMs to just skip all of the context and start talking about something like revenue share. Um, the big picture is super important, especially because we're talking about the future and we're talking about scenarios. Um, I'm also borrowing some data from a presentation that we shared last week on international education. This is really to set the stage about how big um, this topic is. On the left hand side, you can see population forecasts um, out to 2050 showing the number of people around the world who we expect will have a post-secondary credential and that number will reach around 2 billion. Uh, by 2050, the delta between now and that and then is is about a billion. Um, on the right hand side, you can see that billion stacked by the region of the world that we expect um, them to come from. And furthermore, they're shaded to show by decade uh, what that looks like. So in Asia, you can see the acceleration, 170 million people between now and 2030 or 2020 and 2030, achieving a post-secondary credential, accelerating to 209 million the decade after, 211 million the decade after, decade after that, Asia comprising you know, 590 million more post-secondary credentials or graduates essentially. Um, you know, big question in everyone's mind here is when we say post-secondary credential, are we talking about a degree? Are we talking about a certificate? Um, that's a great question, and I suspect that will change quite significantly um, from decade to decade out to um, out to 2050 here. Um, it could be any one of the above. The point we're trying to underscore here is the demand for the post-secondary market is enormous. It is massive. Um, much of it, if you're thinking globally, um, will come from Asia. And many are surprised at Africa when they see these charts. Um, if we extend a little bit further, I mean, Africa um, is just a massive population growth engine. Of course, we're all uh, thoughtful about what COVID has done to the birth rate and how that might play out over time. All these variables are very sensitive to those, um, to those assumptions. Um, on the supply side, if you like, and um, I should have mentioned, this is not going to be an emotively charged take on OPMs. This is a very data-driven, microeconomic, um, scenario-based um, evaluation. And so it might, might be a little dry for those who came here for, um, for a fight. Um, on the supply side, um, let's look at the top 1,000 universities. Uh, in the middle chart and on the right-hand side, we've mapped the Times Higher Ed top 1,000 universities. In the middle, you can see the count of those universities colored by their ranking in each part of the world. Um, you know, Europe taking the, the top there, 495 of the top 1,000 universities according to Time Higher Ed are in Europe. And you can see uh, 97 of those in, in, in Europe there um, from the top 200. That's that way to read that chart. We've then looked at the enrollment capacity of those institutions in the top 1,000. 23 million students from the enrollment capacity that is a very, very small number compared to the previous numbers we looked at in terms of how many students we need to, to graduate over the next 30 years. Um, nonetheless, you can see the enrolment capacity there. And that's a reflection on the supply side, if you like, of post-secondary credentials, specifically looking at universities. They won't all come from, from universities over time. Um, one of the things that uh, Lucy has been leading is a deep dive into digital transformation. As she mentioned, we uh, shared quite recently our annual um, survey in higher education on what the 
um, biggest challenge facing your institution was on the left in the blue chart and for kind of non-university and that could include OPMs, other service providers, other enablers as well about what they perceived the biggest challenge facing institutions was. And at the top there you can see was digital transformation, digital adoption. Um, by far, it appears number one um, in all of these polls um, when we speak to institutions and we speak to OPMs as well. Um, a fascinating kind of tour down the challenge list there. There's no short of challenges for universities around the world at the moment, but the, the top challenge consistently now is, is on digital transformation. Um, we, we had a look quite quick, quite recently at the change in uh, US online enrollments in post-secondary institutions over time. And rather than just one big bulky bar chart and it's not clear what's happening underneath, we pulled out the top 23 institutions by number of fully online enrollments. So this is not partial online, this is fully online enrollments at the top 23 institutions by number of online enrollments in fall of 2022. You can see compared to 2012, it's grown 3.5 times. As you read top left, you see, you know, WGU and SNHU, uh, private not-for-profits just exhibiting incredible growth um, in delivering fully online programs. And then across uh, the page, you can see a whole bunch of different patterns um, as institution strategies changed, what's a little bit interesting um, and a challenge is how to deal with data coming through COVID. Data from 2020, data from 2021, we were just tearing iPads apart the other day. It's going to be very inconsistent, the data we're reading through 2020 and 2021 the way people are responding to questions, the way they're interpreting the definition of online. I think it, it will be it will be challenging to make too many calls from some of that information for some time to come. Nonetheless, there is an explosion in online enrolments. We don't, hopefully post COVID won't be going to conferences, hearing presentations about whether online is a thing or whether it's a good thing. And we've moved along to how to deliver outstanding um, online education experiences. Before we kind of jump into uh, the next part, we want to get your take because we have some data here, but we don't want to lead the witness on um, what you see as uh, either your institution, there's at least 50% of you here are from universities, um, your institution's overall approach to outsourcing digital capability. And we've carefully picked um, carefully and nervously picked a few words there um, about outsourcing digital capability. So um, if you're a university, go ahead and answer in the psyche of your institution. And if you're not, um, think of another institution that you know well. Um, fascinating results. They're definitely going to be biased because we've got a whole bunch of OPMs on, uh, on the um, on the call here. Yeah, this, this is where you'd love to kind of break out into a proper discussion about what all, what's the, what's the stories behind all of these choices. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's also a great invitation. If you have some context that you'd like to add, um, throw it into the chat. It's a, it's a great place. There's, there's often better insights in the chat um, than there are on the slides because we're hearing from uh, those, those in the know, those who are doing that. But nonetheless, when you look at the poll, I mean, it, this is this is a really fascinating result. I think it is a little bit biased, um, given the given the audience. But when we asked uh, just our university, global university, global higher education network, which is you know several thousand folks from institutions um, around the world, and the, the results do differ by geography. But in the main, you can see here the comparison of the response to this question in 2020 versus 2021. I think the, the thing that really jumped out at us was for large institutions and extra large institutions defined by enrollment capacity. Um, you know, there's a, a really, really big jump in uh, the institution's overall approach to, to outsourcing digital capability. Um, a decline um, in, in, in part for smaller and medium who said they'd prefer not to outsource. Um, 
year on year and then some smaller smaller changes but um pretty fascinating in that respect and then fascinating responses here today as well i mean i think the big picture here uh what we're seeing is there is increasing acceptance of and increasing appetite for strategic partnerships to deal with such a complex and multi-year challenge for for institutions through their digital transformation journey of course universities have choices um, we've all got choices when we're thinking about capability building one of the reasons that we built the digital capability framework was um, firstly to help understand what the capability blocks that an institution should uh, build for digital transformation and the flip side was and you know really the genesis of the HEDC was trying to evaluate different OPM business models and understand which capabilities OPMs were building um, as part of that partnership offering. And so whether you are um, an OPM, but more distinctly, if you're an institution, you have three choices really broadly. Um, you can buy discrete services in, um, you can build them yourselves, and perhaps you're not embarking on building on another Zoom, but you're probably building a team that is responsible for building and delivering online programs, um, or you can partner as well. And in this buy build partner kind of decision set, we've tried to map out a few things. Um, there are some notes here on the process. So um, the processes differ quite significantly if you are going to Senate and um, deciding, you know, we are not going to outsource this, we're gonna build it ourselves. Here is a five to 20 year business plan costings the talent we're going to need to acquire, the relationships we're going to need to build versus a partnership, which is much more um, many cases driven by a, um, a request for proposal, you know, long period of establishing relationships and understanding capabilities and gaps um, versus the buy process, which is a little bit more transactional. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see how those decision sets from what we've seen uh, really differ across an institution's current digital level of digital capability um, and also their, their risk appetite. Um, generally, universities um, are risk averse, um, but uh, there are some who through COVID as well have started to change their, their approach to risk and, and are thinking about risk in a whole different, different way as well. From a buy perspective, if you pull apart all of these capabilities and unbundle them, typically in demand and discovery, we're talking about enrollment management or recruitment, generally uh, commission based, generally based on volume or tuition. And that's kind of the genesis of that unbundled business model. In learning design, it's generally consulting, time and materials based. You're probably either um, hiring in talent to lead that process or you're working with an expert learning design team um, who are supporting you in that process, um, perhaps subject matter experts as well. Learner experience is quite tricky. You're going to have a broad collection of subscription based technology. Um, you're also going to have per student or per program costs to support that work as well. And in work and lifelong learning, it's really an emerging space. You might have some partnerships. You might be using some technology on a subscription basis to support students in the process of exploring careers, looking at hiring, building their portfolio of credentials through the process as well. Um, but partnership, as we'll see in the data very shortly, is really accelerating as a preferred model for institutions who are looking um, to partner as part of their digital transformation. Public-private partnerships are, are quite prolific in other impact sectors, um, other of the, the sectors that Lucy talked about, whether they be in climate or in healthcare, they're much more um, prolific than they are in education. Education is no stranger to PPPs, but um, they're often to do with, with infrastructure at the university or with non-academic services such that we call these academic public-private partnerships because the partner is deeply involved in supporting the learner and in learner-facing processes within your institution. And as such, it's, it's a very important strategic partnership um, for the institution as well. So let's dive into some of the numbers um, before we look forward to, to the future. Globally, education um, is about a $7.3 trillion industry, or will be by 2025 as it grows at a, at a, more, uh, at a slower rate 
um, such a large number is growing and driven by population and small changes in price. Global post-secondary market makes up about 2.3 trillion of that by 2025. Um, that includes higher education, includes vocational, uh, it, in, it includes alternative credentials as well. Um, the global online degree and micro-credential market, and we have purposefully blended those together. And as we talk about the future, they are just becoming blended right in front of our eyes. Um, will be, it's growing incredibly quickly, um, about $117 billion by 2025, growing from $45 billion. And so this is the first enormous change in growth rate of these massive global education market at $7 trillion, $2 trillion global higher education market and a market that is more than doubling through the period 2019 to 2025. It will go from making up about 2% of global post-secondary back in 2019 to by 2025 represent still only about 5% in our view, which um, some think is an incredibly conservative view. We'd prefer to probably be sitting on that side of, of, of an outlook. The global OPM market um, was, uh, you know, a little over $5 billion in 2019 and is growing very quickly as well. We'll represent about 13.3 billion by 2025. Um, it's important to note here that this is total OPM, OPM revenue. It's not the total tuition of OPM powered programs when we talk about that $13.3 billion. So uh, a, a very large market uh, by anyone's standards, but you can see relative to the size of global post-secondary, still quite emerging um, in, in nature. Uh, for those who are a regular Holland IQ uh, followers or customers, obviously, for sure, you'll see the work that we do every quarter to update the market on the progress of um, OPM bootcamp and pathway partnerships. This is a, a 10 year plus look back at the number of partnerships. These charts are showing the partnerships established each year. This is not a running total of the cumulative number of partnerships. Um, this is showing the number of partnerships established each year. In blue, we can see US universities establishing those partnerships. And in green, we can see international universities outside the US market, which as you can see, represents such an enormous share. And in many cases, started these models themselves over time. Online program partnerships through 2021, there were 342 universities who through the year established a OPM partnership um, through through 2021, massive growth. You can see the spike from 2020 to 2021 there as well. Um, in total, that represents now, you know, approaching 2000 universities and branch campuses from over 80 countries that we track who have an OPM bootcamp or international pathways partnership. What you can see here along the X axis is those 1,700 partnerships. That's what the width of this chart is representing. And so the US, the largest share there, you can see has the most number of universities out of those 1,700 who have established one of those partnerships. And the colors show the size of the university whom established that partnership within the stack of the US's share of those universities. So 39% of the universities in the United States who established those partnerships were between one and 5,000 enrollments. And as you look up the stack, you can see say purple, uh, very large over 20,000 enrollments as an institution. And then you start to look across at some of the other major economies that we're tracking um, academic public private partnerships in and how that mix varies of the size of institution rest of world uh, we should have broken out it includes markets such as latin america southeast asia increasingly middle east and north africa sub-saharan africa as well other parts of europe of course um, as we start to see this model really expand and be taken up globally. 
We're diving right into the detail here to show the evolution of program share by level over time. So on the left hand side, we're looking at US programs. So this is not partnerships. This is now an MBA that a uh, an OPM is powering with a university or a, a master's in, in, in healthcare. Um, you can see the, the trend on the left hand side in the US programs, graduate degrees represented in yellow, undergrad represented in green and non-degree represented in blue. The change in year to year is the change in the cumulative share as we change over time. If we were looking at each individual year, it would be quite choppy and it would be hard to see, it would be dominated by whatever partnerships were established in that year. But you can see here, for example, in the US, the increasing share of non-degree programs as we've moved through time. And we're on the right hand side, we're looking at all non-US, we've called international program evolution, started with a much higher focus on non-degree programs than in the US and a, and a lower share to start with of graduate formal credentials. You can see undergrad is actually shrinking. It's a little bit more visible and it started a lot larger on the international program side to get a feel for, for those as well. Um, quite recently, we released some data on the economic model, the dominant economic model uh, that is being agreed between universities and, and OPM partners over time. So these charts again are organized on the left, the US on the right, non-US we've labeled international. You can see the change in time. The percentages here only relate to the partnerships that were established in that year. Um, and on the left hand side through the US, you can see revenue share starting um, in the 90s. And then uh, over time, uh, we, we've got to the point in 2021 that it's re representing 80, which I think surprises uh, a lot of people who uh, think through reading the media and all sorts of um, quite emotively driven analysis of the market. Um, universities and OPMs are predominantly choosing a revenue share based economic model to drive their strategic partnership. You can see in the, in the international market even, even more so as well. Um, not to take away any of the arguments that are driven by either side. This is actually very, very typical when we look at our other impact sectors in health and in climate um, for a mature risk sharing relationship where one partner is bringing capital and capability and the other partner is uh, the one who is the principal who owns the credential or, or who owns the, um, the capability set um, in total to do that as well. So fascinating to see the evolution of that trend um, and where it will head. Um, as Lucy mentioned, it's hard not to talk about boot camps uh, when you're talking about OPMs these days. Many OPMs have acquired a boot camp. Uh, many new OPMs kind of look like boot camps or maybe were one day boot camps. And let us kind of dive in here a little bit just to explain that adjacency. Um, reflecting back on this chart in terms of partnerships, you can see that the, the fastest growing partnership market is the boot camp market. So these are universities who are establishing a relationship with a private partner who is bringing uh, curriculum, um, often bringing instructors or connectivity to um, industry based instructors um, to support those programs. And uh, also importantly, bringing relationships with technology firms and, and more broadly industry who are looking to hire um, graduates from boot camp programs as well. Uh, for some time, these were established with, say, the continuing education department. Um, increasingly, they're being established with departments of computer science, um, business schools. There's a really much broader range now of um, departments within a university who are looking to establish a relationship with, with a boot camp partner. Um, we, we've deep dived into this market and released some analysis earlier this week or last week. Um, about the size of the, the, the boot camp market. We've seen it grow from its formation kind of early last decade 
um, at about $200, billion, $200 million in 2015 to represent about, about $1.2 billion in 2020. And we think it will be heading towards around um, $3 billion by 2025. Uh, we've seen incredible growth in the, the business to consumer market here, providing learners directly with uh, 12 week immersive programs, which are typically around 15,000 US dollars if you're in the US market. Um, we've seen a channel expansion. Boot camps are now working directly with universities. They're working directly with businesses to upskill and reskill their staff. And they're also working directly with governments around the world who are doing national level programs to upskill um, the population and to really upskill the economy through this digital transformation as well. And we've seen product expansion through here, started as coding boot camps very quickly into digital marketing. Uh, now we're seeing you know, DevOps, data science and analytics, cyber has been very big and even tech sales training to onboard, um, to onboard career switches and, and novices into the field of, of tech sales too. Um, and as you've seen in all of our analysis, the geographic markets are growing really considerably. Europe has seen a big uptake, um, India as well. We've seen out of Israel, um, no surprise, a lot of cyber capability that is now being exported around the world through the bootcamp programs um, too. Um, boot camps, you know, started as B2C, have very quickly, as you've seen, started partnering with universities. One of the reasons that we're talking about it is, uh, of course, we've seen you know signature acquisitions like two years acquisition of Trilogy. There's been a number of boot camp um, OPMs which have acquired a boot camp. You know, boot camps are now partnering with universities. Uh, a lot of boot camps are now online um, for universities who are looking to establish a broad-based set of relationships to bring some of these capabilities. They're also converging. If you are at a university and looking to appoint you know, someone who's going to lead online programs, continuing education, digital transformation and skills, um, you know, you, you are going to be talking to all of these, all of these, these partners around the world. Um, that $1.2 billion extends across consumer, across university and across the B2B digital skills programs. And now we're seeing convergence with the likes of boot camps and say the Coursera's and the Udemy's the plural sites who are providing digital content, digital curriculum, digital instruction, but are starting from a very different place. Um, you know, universities are, are generally very fond of boot camps because they started their existence as cohort driven instructor led face to face programs, which is very similar, obviously, to um, the primary mode that universities are delivering. So boot camps are growing from that direction up and out. Um, back towards, say, uh, a Coursera or an edX who started life um, as a MOOC working in, in generally a, an asynchronous on demand environment and then are working back towards something and OPMs perhaps represent where those two meet in the middle. All right, we are nearly there. We're now going to pause and look out to the future. Um, what might OPMs look like in 2030? What might this uh, market look like in 2030 as well? Um, we're going to keep the scenarios that we established in 2018, 2019 for this set because we would like to publish after this, this work some kind of longitudinal analysis of your um, your thoughts on, on the, the scenarios for, for OPMs. I don't think these scenarios are going to make another iteration, though, because the market is changing so quickly. This will probably be the last time, but this is a, a still a, an incredibly relevant and very interesting take. So the main questions around the future of OPM hinge around two dimensions. That is whether on the x-axis institutions will seek to outsource digital capability and specifically online programs or whether that will become business as usual and it will be insourced. The other dimension that is the primary dimension of whether the services for digital transformation will be fragmented and unbundled or whether they will be consolidated into a, a, a smaller market of providers as well. 
So when we cut those two dimensions together, we get four scenarios. The blue scenario here we call OPX oligopoly. Um, OPX is a term, if you Google Holonoq OPX, you'll read all about our um, observation of a number of different markets all converging. Micro credentials, education is a benefit, OPM, boot camps, some aspects potentially of international education as well. We call this OPX, you know, X is basically a variable for insert a number of different models here. What we see in this scenario per the axes is we see institutions deciding to outsource and institute and the market consolidating. And so we see what is, you know, if you're in the US, it probably feels like a small market. You could name the 20 or so OPMs. Um, I'm here to tell you, you're not looking hard enough. There is a massive long tail now that is growing. And globally, there is a very significant number of medium to large players who are growing very quickly through the rest of the world as well. The OPX oligopoly scenario sees some consolidation over time of the, on the supply side. Um, on the right hand side, we're still in consolidation. We see university network. Um, we see a lot, a lot of our university colleagues have a strong preference for this scenario where essentially universities recognize that they all have the same problems, they all have the same challenges, they all have the same opportunities, and they form networks together to build that capability to power that entire network. In yellow, we have OPX unbundling, which is the market rolling towards a preference for unbundled services that they pick and choose independently and they don't procure a, a bundled um, OPM partnership. Um, a scenario like this would evolve where universities you know, rapidly built digital capability internally and were um, in a more of a, a better position to procure individual services that they felt fitted them versus partnering with somebody who has um, the ability to manage that complexity and generate synergies from, from that collection of activities as well. And in red is basically the, the you know, university do-it-yourself model, which is a university saying, I'm not going to join a network. I'm not going to um, partner with an OPM. Um, I'm going to do a lot of this myself. I'm not even going to procure. I procure as few services as possible. I want to complete every activity on that digital capability map that, that Lucy shared with us, and I, and I want to do it all, all in-house, and they are the extremes there. So... Um, before we share with you some of the historic results, we want to hear from, and there really is probably the largest collection of global experts in OPMs as I look at the participant list here on this on this OPM, which scenario you think would be the most likely. Now, really importantly, as we send this poll live, this is not what your personal preference is. This is not what your company wants the world to be or your university wants the world to be. This is you, Professor X putting on your analytical hat of which scenario you think will be the most likely um, as the way that the world unplays. Please don't respond to this in terms of personal preference, company desired end state, university uh, desired end state either. This is you putting on an, an analytical hat. Where do you think we will be in 2030 if you were forced to pick one of these four scenarios? because I know you want to pick a few. All right, we're looking good on time. Um, what's your take, Lucy? There's a, yeah, straight up there was OPX unbundling and then it's kind of um, being pulled back a little bit with OPX oligopoly. And then there's tiny, tiny percentages for university network and university DIY. This is, yeah, this is, this is really different to <laughs> the responses we've seen before. Mm. I mean, I again, I still don't know whether everyone participating can see the percentages, but OPX unbundling is 53% uh, of respondents, just over 50%. Not far behind is OPX oligopoly, 40%. So that would be a consolidation of the OPM market to, towards a, a uh, you know dominant handful of players University network, this is very different to what we've seen before. Only 5% mm. of respondents think that that will be the uh, most likely scenario. And, and I don't think I've ever seen 
university DIY so low. <laughs> so reflecting on, on those results and sharing with you, um, and because we were maybe a little bit too analytic for our own good sometimes, this was the, um, the ranking of responses uh, last year uh, when we conducted this. So University Network was the first, OPX Oligopoly was second, OPX Unbundling was third, and University DIY was fourth. What those percentage bars are showing you is rather again than just one big number that's obfuscating what's happening underneath, which is a big spread of people who think uh, the likelihood of each individual scenario when we did this in detail with our global higher education network. So this is a very big change in that unbundling has gone from third to first today. OPX Oligopoly is still in second place. Our university network has fallen way behind down to number three. And what's not really clear when comparing to this chart is the gaps from today's pulse survey are massive. Unbundling is way out in front with 52%. OPX oligopoly, it's not too far behind with 40%. University network is is quite low and university DIY is, is a few people are hanging on um, for that. Really, really fascinating um, results there. Thank you everyone for contributing. Awesome, thank you. And I'll just take a minute to wrap things up. I have to say, Patrick, I don't know if you could see the chat. Um, there's so many questions in there and I would have loved to have interrupted you and, and fed them to you. We're gonna have to look at them afterwards. Um, there's clearly so much interest, I think in the next detail down and we thought this was data heavy already. So um, lots of really interesting questions and discussion happening there. Um, and we are already two minutes over time. So let me just give you a couple of other places to go if you're looking to explore some of these things more. Um, the framework is a great start for conversations if you're at the beginning of this journey or you're looking at revisiting um, how di digital capabilities and OPMs and other themes fit into what you're doing. Um, please, it's an open framework. Use it, print it out, tear it up, write all over it. Um, and we love to hear about what you're doing with it um, in all these different ways. Um, another way to go deep is looking at the global case study series that we put together um, last year, and that looks at how these things actually play out. Each of them kind of touches on buy, build, partner and how those decisions get made in real digital capability initiatives that have happened and, and seen impacts of things. So um, they're a wonderful collection. Please do explore those. Um, as I said at the beginning, um, we're a little way through the series. If you don't want to miss future things and, and future updates on OPMs and lots of other topics, best way to stay on top of that is the Global Higher Education Network, um, which you can see a link to under there. Super quick to subscribe and you can make sure that you're, um, you're told about future webinars and future summits and so on. Um, in person, Patrick and Maria are about to um, be in person again and lots of other whole and iq people so two weeks time less than two weeks time in the uk maria is going to be at the times higher ed digital universities week event um, and then patrick will also be in may in boston um, and in very little time at all the asu gsb summits coming up in san diego and there'll be a bunch of friendly whole and iq folks to hang out with there so um, please if you're in the area do come along um summits is getting super exciting. Um, these are back in person for Whole and IQ and they run from September through to November um, this year. Um, if you go to summits.wholeandiq.com, you'll see if they're in a city near you, um, you can subscribe to keep updated and find out when they're coming. And we can't wait to be in the same room as many of you um, in a matter of months. Um, and then, yeah, next time we're going to Latin America. We can't wait. Super, super interesting report with the Inter-American Development Bank. And we are um, stoked to be able to share some of the findings of that with you in a couple of weeks. So please come along for that. We'd love to see you. Wonderful. Amazing job, Lucy. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us from all around the world. There are some wonderful questions here. I agree. Um, I'm so sorry we couldn't um, get to some of those. Uh, look, if you are not already, sign up to the newsletter at holonacu.com to stay in touch with all the amazing insights coming out from our team. Um, if this is an area you need to double click on, um, go to the website and request a demo and our team will share um, all of the data and platform that we use that's available to our customers to power your own analysis on the future of OPMs. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today. Thanks everyone. Well, See you next time. <laughs>